everyone, and welcome to the Catalyst Wedding Review Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Jen Simako, the leader behind Catalyst Wedding Co., the one and only print and online wedding publication dedicated to taking an intersectional approach to weddings. Each week on this podcast, as you know, we're looking at the role that pop culture plays in how we think about weddings, how we talk about weddings, what we think weddings should look like, all of it. And so this week, we are looking at the movie Jenny's Wedding, which came out in 2015 and is starring Katherine Heigl and Alexis Bledel. And so this movie is not like 27 Dresses or any other romantic comedy that we've seen Katherine Heigl in before, as the plot of this love story is not about Katherine Heigl trying to win the man of her dreams but instead is about coming out as a lesbian to her family and marrying her partner, played by Alexis Bledel. And really, the plot here is not as critical as the themes that this movie addresses. And so before we get into that, I just want to say that I am so happy to be joined here today by my guest, Bethany Frazier. Hey there. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. So. Bethany is the creator of Maven Made, which is an all-natural and handcrafted line of skincare and wellness products. Do you want to talk a little bit more about Maven Made? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So um, I created Maven Made really out of a solution to help my skin issues. I struggled with uh, like oily skin and cystic acne um, for years and years and years, and I'd been on Accutane and used all the harsh, chemical, proactive, astringent type of cleansers and treatments on my skin. And finally, my intuition kind of kicked in, and I started thinking about other solutions, mainly natural solutions. So I started researching nutrition and meditation and um, supplements and oils essential and fatty oils and this is before like the essential oil craze blew up but i started to research and i ended up developing a facial serum that truly transformed my skin and it is the same exact facial serum um the formula has stayed the same maybe i've added one ingredient but the serum changed um my skin and also you know boosted my confidence. So I was like, there's something to this. A few core products were launched. Um, This all started in 2013, officially launched in 2014. The line has just grown. And I have to say tomorrow, I am leaving my full-time job to go full-time with Maven Maid. So it's a really, I'm just so grateful that um, this has been part of my life, but it's really fun. I mean, I get to make all the products by hand and also the feedback that I get from people that it's helped boost their confidence or it's helped them sleep better at night or whatnot. And they're not using toxic chemical products on their skin. Just that that's what I'm here to do. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. And so full disclosure, Maven Made is a sponsor of Catalyst Wedding Co. Bethany has sponsored a number of events that we've held, and I am a a personal user of your facial serum, and it is amazing. I also am a huge fan of your new astrology line, and I just received my my Pisces essential oil blend uh, in the mail today from you, and so I would love to have you kind of share a little bit about your new astrology line before we dig into the movie. Yes, I would love to talk about this. So this is a product line that I had thought about for a while. Nothing really felt super special about it for me to formally launch it. So the core of the product, um, they are roll-on blends made with essential and fatty oils to really balance out each zodiac aspect. So for instance, um, the Taurus roll-on blend has ylang-ylang in it and cardamom. Tauruses are kind of stuck in their head, resistant to change, bullheaded, but they also have this passionate side of them. So what the cardamom does is it's spicy, helps kind of wedge them out of their stubbornness. And also the ylang-ylang is super feminine, super floral, induces feelings of joy. So helps to get them a little, uh, I guess, enhance that passionate side, but also get some feeling a little bit more flowy, maybe a little bit more watery because Taurus is such a grounding earth sign. 
And then what I came across that made the whole line come together and made it feel special enough to launch, I have topped each one with a real crystal or gemstone roller top that correlates with each astrology sign too. So using the Taurus roll-on as an example, um, that one has a heart opening, joy inducing rose quartz roller ball on top of it. Yeah, they are not only is the essential oil blend amazing, but like just as an object, these things are beautiful. So they are. Uh, things, for sure. Uh, yeah. So if you're somebody who is believes in the power of essential oils, the power of gemstones, loves astrology, really need to just encourage you to go check that out. So just wanted to make sure everyone knew about the awesomeness before we, we got too far down the rabbit hole yeah. here. Yeah. As people know on this podcast, I'm not the one who picks what movie we review or what TV show we review each week. That is up to my guests. So would you tell us a little bit about why you picked Jenny's Wedding in particular? Because I hate this movie. (laughs) That is why my wife and I even joke about this movie from time to time. It is so dark and dreary and it is not the accurate depiction for most people of what having a gay wedding is about. I think this movie really does shame to the LGBTQIA community, to be quite honest. And um, I'd love to uh, talk about it. (laughs) As I was watching it, you know, it definitely seems like it was trying to do something, but... (laughs) It never, it never really comes across. Like, I, I think we do have to kind of talk about it in the context of which the movie was made. So it came out in July of 2015, just a month after the Supreme Court decision to legalize same-sex marriage across the country. That means that all of the production for this film was done prior to that decision. And so I can see that maybe they thought that they were doing something really important, but given the context of when it came out and the execution of the film, and Mm. it just really, really falls short. So a lot of the conversations that take place in this movie seem especially problematic and bigoted in this post- Obergefell world that we live in now. I agree. (laughs) It's really bad. It's bad. (laughs) It's bad. There's a lot to talk about here, but just to set the scene, the story all centers around this character, Jenny, who's played by Katherine Heigl. She is brought up in a very Catholic family based in Cleveland, Ohio, and it's very, very clear that traditional gender roles are at play in the household where she was raised and with her parents. Yes. Um, we start off the movie by essentially like seeing Jenny at the christening of her niece. I think, I honestly don't know if it's her niece or nephew. It's kind of beside the point. They're at this christening and her mom is just like, oh, she looks so nice holding a baby. (laughs) Oh yeah. Yeah. Smack you in the face. This is about gender roles. Right. There's even a moment at the christening where like the priest is asking her like as as the godmother like do you agree to denounce satan and all of his works and like (laughs) causes and it's like i don't know if i want to agree to that and her her mom comments like she obviously feels guilty about something and so (laughs) that's just kind of to set the context of the family that we are dealing with and obviously people live in those types of families true So the real overarching story here is about Jenny coming out to her family and then ultimately getting married to her partner who is played by Alexis Bledel. Can we talk about how terrible it is that like Katherine Heigl and Alexis Bledel have zero chemistry? Oh my God. I wish you would have been in our house last night watching this. We had to do a recap. We were yelling at the TV for quite some time. The The chemistry is zero, zero percent. So they kiss two times in the movie, if you want to know. It's so awkward. Every time 
Actually, you know, during the film, there's rarely moments where they're touching one another. And when they are, it is, it's like uh, somebody touching sandpaper. It's very, very awkward. <laughs> and also, I hate how they infantized Alexis Bladell's character. I mean, it's like what film did to uh, Zoe Deschanel make them look like a little girl. Her name's even Kitty. Like she has like bows in her hair. And, and I just, I hate that. Like there was nothing real or sexual or fun about these two together. It was, it just amplified the awkwardness of the whole movie. I also kind of want to talk a little bit about, it's the same kind of issue, you know, we see a lot of styled shoots come through at Catalyst where we see two straight people trying to depict a same-sex couple in a styled shoot, and there's an absolute lack of chemistry. <laughs> right. And granted, actors have to feign interest for the person that they're playing a romantic lead against all the time, but in this particular case, like... I, I don't know if the direction was poor, the writing was poor, or their acting is just really, really poor. But because these are two straight women playing queer women, it just comes off so terribly. Yes. For a movie that takes this on, it's really frustrating that the two main characters are both played by straight actors. I don't know. You're like, oh, you like each other? <laughs> You're getting married? <laughs> Who would have thought? Um, uh, but yeah. So yeah. when she finally comes out, I mean, she's obviously like well into her late 20s, maybe early 30s. It's not really clear. Her and Kitty, once again, terrible name, um, have been in – a partnership for five years they've lived together they're in a serious committed relationship and her family just thinks that kitty is her roommate so finally katherine heigl jenny decides that she wants to get married much to the shock of her partner it was almost like they'd never discussed it before <laughs> It was, that scene was so bizarre. No one ever proposed to one another. It was just like this aloof thing. And there was no physical interaction when Katherine Heigl nonchalantly mentions that she wants to get married. It was just like, okay, it was bizarre. It is bizarre. They just kind of sat down at a table across from each other and were like, okay, I guess we're getting married. Like... We see them, like, lying in bed together once, but it's also just, like, a, it's, like, Alexis Bledel is spooning Katherine Heigl and just, like, patting her on the shoulder. Patting. Yeah. You're exactly right. It is, at best, a friend relationship in terms of the energy between them. And Absolutely. that's so frustrating. You know, they should have just stuck with the roommate thing, to be quite honest. <laughs> Yeah, it could still be about her coming out to her family, but, like, this shouldn't be the person she's, like, no. in a relationship with. Yeah, it was, um, it was painful to watch. It really was, their, their interaction. And also that that, you know, I think that this movie is, um, has, is very risky, too, because when I was engaged to my wife, my aunt emailed me and said that she saw Jenny's wedding and it made her think of me. And I'm thinking, this is the standard that Hollywood has for our family to understand, like, what? This is, this is not reality. And I was thinking, it's a terrible film. It is not anywhere near, you know, our experience or a lot of people's experience for that matter. And our relationship is not lackluster either, <laughs> as this one is depicted. There's no passion there. <laughs> Mm, no. And I really like can't pinpoint one particular thing that's the cause for why this movie is so terrible because there are so many things. <sighs> Maybe but, the music too. Whoever <laughs> picked the music, <laughs> let me tell you, bad, bad, bad all the way around too. Just whiny. Well, I was watching it with my husband Cameron and he was like, did they only have budget for like five songs? Because exactly. they just play the same 
five songs over and over again. And the way that they edit in the music is also really jarring and yes. rough. There are moments where they try to use the music as a cue for like, this is a romantic moment or this is a, you know, a stressful moment. This is a turning point. And because the music is also so bad, it does nothing to help the fact that the acting is really, really bad. Mm -hmm. We could argue that neither Catherine Heigl or Alexis Bledel are, you know, the best actors in their field, but anyways, it it shouldn't be this bad. It shouldn't. And you know what is kind of bizarre is uh, the woman who plays Catherine Heigl's sister, which I think that is Meryl Streep's daughter, should have been one of the lesbians. Because let me tell you, she seemed like a natural. <laughs> How so? What What about her and her character? Makes you she feel just, that way? she definitely seemed uh, more queer than Bladell or Heigl put together. Did you yeah. get that? She was definitely had more of a character. They kind of went off the rails with her at yeah. the end. I think that really it's that she's the only one with any real character in the entire movie, whether or not that means she would have been better at playing a queer character or not. She's just the only one that actually has any character development whatsoever. And that's saying yeah. something because she still has very little character development. Right, right, exactly. Mm. So if we're talking about this movie in the context of it being like a coming out story, because obviously it's not a love story because there is no love. There is no romance. There's no passion. This has to, I feel like, be discussed and looked at purely as like a coming out story because there's nothing to make you feel like you're just rooting for those people to get together. Right, right. Um, and I feel like the point of view is so from the parents or it's really focused in on uh, the family rather than, you know, they call this movie Jenny's Wedding. It should be called My Daughter's Gay Wedding. <laughs> it's, it is... Very bizarre how the alignment and the focus is constantly on these parents who are, you know, going in circles and banging their heads against the wall that they did something wrong, you know, which, which is a common thing sometimes when, when people do come out. But I mean, it was just constantly just whining about the parents and the sister and, and, you know, having this basically a uh, social crisis of how are we going to tell our friends? And it's like, oh my gosh. I mean, yeah. it was 2015 when this was filmed. It's Even very centering. It's, yes. There's a lot of centering happening here where it's, you know, when Katherine Heigl comes out first to her mom, it's like, what did I do wrong? Mm -hmm. Also, you've been lying to me your whole life. It's all about how your actions have affected me as opposed to the fact that like your daughter is telling you that she's been afraid to tell you this thing because of how you would react and obviously right. justified in that. And that suddenly something has changed about her core personality and she's like, this is just me. This is how I've always been, which I, you know, is one of the few good lines in this movie is like nothing changes when suddenly you discover that your child's sexuality is not what you thought it was. Right. Um, but the, the whole secretive I've been living with a liar and the amount of guilt that they place on Jenny's character for not coming out to them sooner is so awful. <laughs> Yeah, it is awful. And it's, I feel like it, it lingers too long too. That part they focus in on for, for such a long time. And then when her sister finds out, it's like, it was almost like she got cheated on. I mean, it was, it was very bizarre. Yeah. How, how the, those scenes or that theme just lingered a little, a little too long. <laughs> and she says something to her sister of like, I could never risk getting close to you because I was in hiding. And like her sister is just, she kind of understands, but she is also still very, very hurt. And I can kind of understand a little bit of that dynamic, but still to 
continue to push, especially from her parents, this idea of you lied to us, that makes you a bad person from this very Catholic traditional mindset. Oh, it's just bad. Yeah, it definitely is. And, you know, in saying all this, I know that everyone who comes out, if they choose to come out to their family, there are, unfortunately, families that react like this. And it feels like this movie. And I'm not trying to bash that experience, but for Hollywood to create an atrocity like this and release it and have this be a depicting um, story, I think for other people to see and maybe compare, it could have been better. It could have been a little more uplifting. I mean, even at the end of this film, you know, I felt like a constant theme was Katherine Heigl not being able to please her parents, whether she was going to have children or get married. And at the end, at their wedding, oh, spoiler alert, they do get married, they have a wedding. And at the wedding, her mom apparently loves a conga line. So Katherine <laughs> Heigl slips in a damn $10 bill to the DJ and they do a conga line for the mom. It's like you're still appeasing your mom. And they roll credits over the most obnoxious conga line known to man. And very awkward. And I don't know if you saw Katherine Heigl's hands on Alexis Bledel, but it was still awkward. Through this entire thing, they have one scene where... Katherine Heigl and Alexis Bledel are with Jenny's sister, Anne, trying on wedding dresses, and they're trying them on together, and, you know, the bridal salon person says something about, you should come back here with your moms, and then, and then Jenny gets super sad, and Alexis Bledel, I kind of refuse to call her by the name Kitty. It's just too bad. It is. Um, <laughs> Alexis Bledel is like, you know, my mom's not here either. And it's one of the few moments where it's like, um, hello, I'm also struggling with this and my family dynamics. Right. Because the entire movie pretty much kind of sticks to a stereotypical wedding rom-com script and where like it's all about the bride and in this case they treat Jenny as the only bride and they do not acknowledge Kitty and Kitty's role she barely has any lines and like Catherine Heigl gets walked down the aisle there's all this attention about her family and It just plays into a lot of stereotypical gender roles and they are applying them to this same-sex relationship. And that's kind of a theme throughout the whole thing too, where like her mom's like, I wonder who proposed. Her dad's like, I don't know how you guys have sex. I just don't understand. I just don't. Oh my gosh. I got some one-liners from the dad written down. They're, They're quite, quite some gems. Terrible, terrible quotes in this movie. Yeah, share some of them. We're ordinary people, not rebels. Let that one sink in. Because having a um, a queer daughter is an act of rebellion. You're the re- rebel family. Um, and I think the one uh, that's the cherry on top of the cake. One of the worst quotes, and they did it like at a very like poignant moment in the film. And he says, "All you can do is what you can do." And that goes back to, like, to the idea that, like, he did something wrong or, like, they didn't do enough or they tried their best, but she still came out queer. And, like, they even make some comment about when the mom and dad are talking about, like, well, they say it's how you're born now. And, (laughs) like, yes... I guess there's some resolution at the end where her parents both show up at the wedding, but like she's just sort of accepting their bigotry through this entire thing, and it's not really condemned. It's like the difference between acceptance and support. Like her parents are willing to support her by showing up at the wedding, but it's clear that they don't have acceptance for her. Yeah, there was never acceptance, a theme or an energy of acceptance or excitement. There was n- no excitement in that whole film, but there was, there was no acceptance. There was no like, this is the way it's going to be. And you know what? We're, 
we're on this path together and let's just enjoy this ride or enjoy this wedding. I mean, everyone looked like they ate a bowl of lemons the whole film. Everyone's, you know, frowny faced, looking like they're going to cry in an instant. I mean, none of it is, is joyful. And it's about a wedding, which to me is really frustrating because, I mean, planning a wedding is naturally stressful. But this movie didn't even, like, have any fun with it. I mean, they were in Nordstrom's finding a dress. But even then, like, that moment was crushed because her sister saw them kissing and embracing one another, which I think that was the second, maybe the first kiss, by the way. Yeah, and then it gets turned into this whole thing about the sister and how she would lie to and the mom and how they kept it from the sister. And it, it's, once again, it's all centering back on these family members. And right. Her brother is the only person that we don't see. Oh, that's true. Yes. Say anything. And she does say, like, when she comes out to her brother, he's like, yeah, I kind of knew. Like, I kind of guessed. And she's just shocked that he's not disapproving. And he's like, why? And she says, you're the most like mom and dad. And then he says, no, Jenny you are and that's like one of the only like moments where I feel like there's some honesty there where yeah. it's like trying to say like the reason that this is so painful is because there's not some self-acceptance right in Jenny's character and I think right. Alexis well, there's Bledel, no empowerment there's no fun there's no light to her character or her fiance's like it's just like dull 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 the whole time i mean what shocked me in this film too is there was never a sense of like a queer support network or friends or a fun night out there was not one scene where Catherine heigl and alexis bladell were out with their friends like talking about this like you normally would complaining about your family or you came out to your parents let's celebrate let's go have dinner let's go have drinks or whatever there was nothing like that in this film in that right there i don't know who directed this but that's not that was very unrealistic because when you do something like that or when you're engaged you're hanging out with your friends. I mean, you have a life. These people didn't have lives, these two characters. I mean, it seemed like they were just centered around just this morose energy and this wedding didn't seem like a joyful thing. It seems like the end, you know, <laughs> like this thing hanging over their shoulders because they committed themselves awkwardly, you know, in their kitchen. And it just, it, didn't seem like a celebration of anything. And that lack of community and friendship and support and fun and activity, there was nothing in this film. Yeah, and you see at the wedding, and I ugh, I don't really love how this was done, there's like suddenly at the wedding, you're surrounded by lots and lots of women dancing with women on the dance floor. Yeah. Oh. And it's like, okay, yes. so you guys have other friends who are also in queer relationships. Where have they been this whole time? Exactly. That was really bizarre, too. There was a moment where, like, her dad's standing on the dance floor and he's looking around and it's like <laughs> women with women and women with women. And there's this the look of horror on his face. And the more... I think about it, the more I'm like, was this movie trying to be pro-LGBTQ rights? Or was it trying to be like, you can be just a regular old Joe like this dude, and you're just trying your best, and you don't really have to like it, but this is what you can do to kind of just do the bare minimum to be an okay human. And we're going to give you a pat on the back for that. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. The bare minimum. That's what this movie should have been called. Jenny's Wedding, The Bare Minimum. I don't know. Like, usually I feel like this podcast, there's so much to talk about, but <laughs> it's just so bad that it's, I almost, like, don't even want to talk about it more. It does make me angry. It. This one really makes, I mean, it is a slap across 
our faces. And the premise of this film actually could have been quite good if done the correct way. Yeah. It could have been really great, but, you know, they just had to trash it up and (laughs) take any type of authenticity. It just, nothing felt authentic about it. And again, it, it rubs me the wrong way that this is a film that's available on Netflix that, you know, moms and parents are watching, you know, maybe when their child finally comes out to them. And this is the first film that maybe they're watching. And this depicts nothing but sad face mood, you know, like it's, it's not uplifting. There's nothing at the end. I mean, what, what, what are they just going to have kids and that, that be it? Because that's what I felt like too. I mean, these gender roles, they were still deeply rooted, even though these were two women getting married. I felt like the only reason they were getting married were to have kids. Even Heigl makes a comment to one of her family friends that I guess we're traditional. We're getting married before we have the kids. And it's like, huh? The context of that conversation and her mom's friend's comments afterwards about like how shameful it is that Uh, her friend's daughter is gay. It's just like, even though her mom comes up and is like defending Jenny and is like- In a very extreme way. In a very extreme way. And it's like, is it normal that your kids mooch off of you? Is it normal that your daughter gets knocked up by everybody? Is it nor like, how is this any, how is this abnormal that my daughter is gay? Which, <laughs> well, throwing your friend's kids under the bus isn't a good way. <laughs> it's not helping the situation. It is not helping the situation <sighs> at all. No. And I know that these people exist. I've met people like this. I'm sure we all have met people like this who are just very, very set in these old, outdated ways of thinking. But this movie does nothing to change those minds. Absolutely. So let's talk about, don't watch it. (laughs) Yeah, don't, don't watch it. Let's instead spend a little bit of time talking about movies or tv shows that do a better job of depicting coming out stories depicting same-sex relationships because i feel like that's the best thing that i can do after talking about yeah let's 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 lift it up a little bit so do you have any suggestions for if you are a mom whose daughter has just come out and you're like, what can I watch? It's not this movie. I, I can't think of anything, but I think for any parent that their child comes out, I think going straight to media and Hollywood to justify your feelings might be one of the worst things that you can do. I think it's really just letting it settle and being okay and you know, I'm a big fan of like, you know, shadow work and and working on your, can can you curse on here? Well, (laughs) working, working on your shit before letting other things infiltrate you. And I think that the society in general has just really put pressure and allowed, you know, mainstream media to kind of um, influence their way of thought. But that being said, I mean, I can't think of anything specific, but the media has gotten absolutely amazing with the inclusivity of every type of sexuality, non-sexuality. It's incredible. And also they're finally casting queer people to play queer people. (laughs) I mean, if you compared this movie where it's about queer issues and nobody involved in it is queer, it's like having a movie to talk about racial issues when everybody's white. (laughs) And it's, just because you can act in a role that says your character is gay does not mean that you can actually depict this character. Right. And it's kind of offensive when they try. I know that, like, it's a little bit different than when in Hollywood we say, like, why couldn't you actually get somebody who is Asian to play an Asian character? Right. Um, because it involves actually being out and open about your sexuality to say like, okay, I am a queer person and I can play this queer character. But 
it is offensive when we see so many straight actors playing queer characters. Just as it's kind of really offensive every time I see a style shoot come through that is two straight people pretending to be in a same-sex relationship. <laughs> because it's, it's, it's not like those people aren't out there. It's not like there aren't queer people in Hollywood. It's not like there aren't queer couples just anxious to get their photos taken. Those people exist. And every time we cast a straight person to play a queer person, we are just continuing to push them down. Absolutely. And, you know, even though they're doing a better job at casting queer people and also people of color, and by the way, I don't even remember one person of color in this movie. There was one black woman at the wedding. Oh, well, there we go. Who was dancing with another woman. So I guess she's one of their lesbian friends. That's it. (laughs) Right. Of course. Yes. This is very whitewashed uh, for sure, but there's still a lack, even though the representation is starting to pick up, there is still a lack of films and media and TV shows that positively depict a gay wedding or pregnancy or, I mean, there's just, there's so many things that are lacking, but, but we have come far. It's like, I can't be too, too negative about it. I really did like, um, really enjoy Transparent and it's just a shame what's happened with uh with that but i think transparent was a really great tv show an outlet it was so vulnerable and the characters were wonderful in that film and even though uh tambor's character you know tambor is not a trans person they did have so many wonderful trans people on the set for the tv show in lesbian and queer people and but that's the only thing that I can think of right now. You know, I'm a big fan. I came out in 2009. So that's when the L word was like huge. And season one and two of that show were kind of my stepping stones. Mm-hmm. It paved a really beautiful um, path, even though they're LA lesbians. But guess what? That's uh, how LA lesbians look and how they act and how they work and play. So it actually <laughs> depicts them pretty well. Um, even though I was like a 27 year old lesbian living in Texas watching the show. But um, I think the L word is a really great series that depicts somewhat accurately lesbian relationships and the perils and the joys and the heartaches. But, you know, as, as the um, seasons progressed, it kind of got crappier and crappier. <laughs> um, but season one and two were definitely top notch. Yeah. And there was that series and I think Queer It's Folk was around the same time yeah. when it came out. But those were definitely, and I think still are seen as shows for people in the queer community and only for people in the queer community. And I definitely wish they were more mainstream and that more people watch them because there aren't that many other sources where we can see queer characters being depicted in in more mainstream television. Right, right. Uh, But still, I mean... So many shows have done it leaps and bounds better than this movie does it. Like, hell, Pretty Little Liars did it better than this. <laughs> yeah. Amen to that. Absolutely. Which is saying something. I'm like, right. you know, when you look back, and I know that you and I are both huge Buffy fans as well as your wife. Yes. Uh, and <laughs> the way that they handled... Willow and Willow coming out in Buffy, <sighs> given the fact that that was what, like, oh my god, two thousand, yeah, yes, and I mean that was like two thousand, yeah, two thousand. It has been eighteen years, fifteen oh. years before this movie was ever made, and the way that they handled Willow's sexuality was so much better than this movie could ever have dreamed to have handled it, right. And she is a straight woman in real life, Allison Hannigan, and she played that role amazing um, and very believable. Same with Amber Benson, who played yeah, yeah. her, her and, partner in that show. And like, yes, also a straight woman, but they 
they were allowed to show passion and like complexity and emotion and Mm -hmm. none of that was in this movie whatsoever. Yeah. And you know, I would have really loved to be on the set of uh, Jenny's wedding to see after the few takes where they're quote unquote intimate and uh, just see that chemistry just fizzle even more once they cut that scene. I mean, it was, un- it, they're uncomfortable together. I just don't understand why creating a movie and the money that goes into that, why the director or somebody there didn't say, hey, this is awkward. I think we need a recast. I think we need to sit down and talk about this. It's like, who was in charge here? Really a shame with this one. Don't watch it. And if you do watch it, do not think that this is what it's really like in a same-sex relationship. This is not just because you are the same gender as your partner does not mean that you only hug each other, you barely kiss, and you pat each other on the arm to show that you care. Literally, pat. (laughs) It was so bad. So, if we remove all of the issues and we just talk about the fact that it seems like over the course of three months they decide to get married, buy dresses, Mm -hmm. plan the whole thing, and have this big wedding, your dad's not going to come, but suddenly shows up at the last minute with the perfect suit and he's ready to walk you down the aisle. And yeah. I guess he was kind of ready. He didn't seem like he really wanted to be there either. He seemed like, oh, I got done cutting the grass. I guess, you know, I'm here. Yeah. Well, oh God, what did he say? He was like, you hurt me. That's why I am not supporting you is because you said mean things to me. You said you wouldn't miss me. Ew. Oh, and there's, you know, I got to say this. There's a lot of weird dad things that he says to her that kind of made us a little uncomfortable. Like, you know, idolizing your father and daddy's little girl. Those themes are pretty rampant in this movie too, which really creeps me out. Yes. The mom and dad are having a conversation and, and the mom is like, Like, I thought she was so much like me. This is a rejection of me. Like, she's rejecting me and who I am by coming out. And the dad is like, well, I'm the man. If she's rejecting anyone, it's me because she doesn't (laughs) like men. (laughs) That's it. That's it. You're exactly right. That's not what this is about. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. It definitely goes back to, like, really outdated ideas of what, like, feminism is and what it means to be a lesbian. It's just that you don't like men and, or that men have harmed you in some way, or it takes away all all of the agency. It has nothing to do with you. Right. It is my individual sexual preference. It has nothing to do with you. And it had nothing to do with sex either in this film. Zero. (laughs) Zero. Yeah. I wish they would have, you know, no, I don't. I I do not wish for a sex scene because it would have been so awkward. Oh, God. Can you imagine? Anyways. And then there's that moment when Catherine Heigl shouts in the funeral home. Oh, God. Kitty, my dad wants to know if you strap it on in bed. And then she just storms out and it's like, uh. And did you notice that she storms out and leaves by herself? Her- yes. And, and does not bring her fiance, who knows no one there. And that was, that plays into the whole gender role-ish thing that you were talking about in the beginning. It's all about her. And I'm sorry, I didn't get the feeling that she was a very good partner to Kitty. I felt like she was pretty uh, mentally checked out and didn't really stand up for her. Well, how can you stand up for your partner if you can't stand up to your to your parents, to be quite honest? But that's a whole other... Yeah, how can you stand up for your partner if you can't stand up for yourself? It's... Right. Yeah. Ugh. Oh. It's basically like the whole thing is Jenny holding this relationship hostage. Absolutely. Which is really awful yeah. in any relationship. Yeah, I really got that feeling. So to the wedding, to wrap this up. Oh, boy. Hmm. Um, 
You know, I would have to say, I mean, they had a band, they had lots of bridesmaids, um, which I saw as they were dancing with one another. They had a lot of bridesmaids dancing, none of which were actually standing with them at the front when they got married. And oh, oh, oh also, Kitty never got to say any vows. Hey, that seems fair, right? Jenny got to say vows, and Kitty didn't get to say any of her vows. We just see Jenny's vows. Of course not. Wow. I mean, the wedding was nice. The, I would probably say, ooh, 30? I would say it's between probably 30 and 50, depending on, like, how much food they had. And it's right. always, that conga line looked like they had at least 50 people. Yes. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, it looked about, like, 75 people. I mean, and a lot of their family friends, too, a lot of older white people. So I imagine that it was kind of, like, a nice – I mean, you could see the tables. Everything looked nice and elegant. Yeah, I would – yeah, maybe, maybe we just meet in the middle and say a solid 40. $40,000 wedding. So, yeah, if anyone is watching this movie and is like, that's a wedding I would like to have, which I doubt severely because this movie is terrible, then expect that that's what that type of wedding would cost. So, yeah, usually, you know, when we're talking about these movies, the weddings seem a little bit more appealing. <laughs> no, I definitely don't think you'll be anyone would be feeling that, especially with that conga line at the end. <laughs> oh. Yeah. All right. Well, in summary, don't watch this movie. The one hour that you've spent listening to this podcast is more about this movie than probably you ever needed to know. <laughs> but <laughs> I think so. I think we covered all the bases. But thanks for listening to us talk about it. And how terrible it is. So before we leave, Bethany, can you just tell everybody who's listening where they can find more about you? Absolutely. So you can find me online at www.mavenmade. So M-A-V-E-N-M-A-D-E-R-V-A dot com. And then you can also find me on Instagram at Maven Made. For everybody, uh, Maven Made RVA. Uh, the RVA is for Richmond, Virginia, oh, which yeah. is where Bethany is located. So you can find all of her amazing products online, but there's also some local places, I think, that stock your products if you're looking for it in person. Yes, um, and several workshops too. Yeah, yeah. And Bethany does workshops not just around essential oils, but also different lunar phases. We're going to do one um, coming up in March. We're talking about cleansing your space and home, literally with um, crystals, rituals, using the moon phases. And also we'll cap it off by everyone gets to make their own all natural antibacterial and um, antifungal antimicrobial um, household cleaner using my beautiful ingredients. If you live anywhere in Richmond, Charlottesville, or surrounding areas, definitely start following Bethany so you can find out about all of these workshops. And thank you, Bethany, again. Yeah, of course. Um, having you here. Yeah, it was a blast, you know, uh, just. <laughs> It was a blast talking, talking about, about how terrible this is. <laughs> Thanks, Bethany. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Jen. Thanks. Bye. Bye. The Catalyst Wedding Review Podcast is a production of Catalyst Wedding Co. Show your support of Catalyst and this podcast by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash catalystwedco. You can find real wedding inspiration and advice for feminists, the LGBTQ plus community, and woke folk at www.catalystwedco.com. And if you're engaged in looking for wedding vendors that share your values, then look no further than the Catalyst Vendor Directory. Also, follow us at Catalyst Wedco on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest. Our theme song was composed by Momentum. Our co-founders are Liz Susong and Carly Romeo. Our operations manager is Marley Hilton. 
Our editorial team consists of Amber Marlowe, Michaela Dietz, Jordan Maney, and Cindy Savage. Our intern is Sydney Zwick. Our advertising and sponsorship team consists of Katie Wannon and Erica Swift. For advertising or sponsorship inquiries, email sales at catalystwedco.com. As always, I am Jen Samako, the CEO of Catalyst Wedding Co., and I am always open to hearing your thoughts. Send your ideas and comments to jen at catalystwedco.com. Thanks everyone and have a great week disrupting the wedding industry.